Well, our scripture reading takes us back in time this morning, some two and a half thousand years, to an event that took place in the year 445 BC. An event which has immense historical and contemporary relevance for us today. This is the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. And while it's located about halfway through the Old Testament, in terms of timeline, we should understand Nehemiah is actually one of the latest of the Old Testament books. Uh, There isn't much, if anything, that takes place after Nehemiah in terms of the Old Testament timeline. So in other words, the events here are some of the last recorded events in the Bible uh, before the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the significance of these chapters, Nehemiah 8 to 10, is enormous. In our studies in Covenant Renewal, uh, we are jumping this morning uh, some 500 years from where we were last week in the days of Asa and Joash. Uh, There was also the days of Hezekiah and Josiah, which we didn't land on, uh, the kings of Judah, uh, who each led the nation in renewing covenant with God. Here we are 500 years on from those days, Uh, And we come today to this dramatic, captivating, and thrilling account of further covenant renewal in the days of Nehemiah. It was earlier in the year when we were in the book of Nehemiah as a congregation. And I'm sure you will remember, many of you, this is a book that describes the rebuilding of Jerusalem's city walls. The people of God have returned from exile, and Nehemiah leads them in a rebuilding project. And chapters 1 to 7 of the book uh, describe that project, how the walls have been rebuilt. And the walls really were rebuilt in record time, uh, just 52 days. And the walls of Jerusalem were built again, the gates all set in place. Remarkable, really. But Nehemiah's job isn't finished. Because while there's been much needed by way of physical renewal, uh, there is still great need for spiritual renewal among these people. A spiritual rebuilding of faith. A spiritual repairing of commitment. And so in these chapters before us, chapters 8 to 10... We have an event uh, described, uh, a transforming spiritual renewal event among the people of God. And spiritual renewal, covenant renewal, is something the people of God need periodically. Uh, Because there are times, aren't there, when our faith grows weak. Uh, When the sharp edge of our commitment and service becomes dull and blunt. Times when we fall away from the Lord. When we need brought back. uh, We need revived. We need restored. We need renewed. Times when we reconsecrate ourselves in a fresh way. Pledging ourselves. Rededicating ourselves. As the covenant community of God publicly. And collectively. As we come to do that today, we want to consider three things from covenant renewal in Nehemiah's day. So, firstly, the foundation of covenant renewal, and really this is chapter 8, the foundation of covenant renewal. Now, there is a large amount of Bible material before us today. There's no way that we can cover everything and do it justice remotely at all. But I want to try and give something of a general bird's eye view of these chapters. And in this eighth chapter, we find that covenant renewal for the people in Nehemiah's day, it didn't spring out of nowhere. Nowhere. 
It wasn't just a bright idea that Joe Bloggs had. No, rather, there was something that paved the way for covenant renewal. And chapter 8 describes it. A major catalyst that just explodes this reaction, a dynamic consequence of covenant renewal, which is later on in chapter 10. And we find the catalyst in verse 1 of Nehemiah 8. Listen to verse 1 once again. All the people gathered as one man into the square, and they told Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. Did you spot it? Did you spot the catalyst, uh, the foundation for covenant renewal? It's nothing less than the word of God, isn't it? These people were so hungry for God's word that they call on Ezra the priest. Ezra, bring the book, they say. Bring the book. They come as one man with one accord and they're, they're crying out for the word. This, this is astonishing, folks. Ezra comes. Uh, remember Ezra, Nehemiah, contemporaries. They work together. Ezra comes. Verse 3 describes how he read from the book. And he read. And he read. And he read. And he read. Uh, verse, four, or verse 3 describes from early morning until midday. For hours. He ministers God's word. And the people are listening attentively. Men, women, children. There's this enormous hunger for the word. There's others alongside Ezra, Levites. Uh, we have them named, a group of them, in verse 7. Uh, and, and perhaps the, the picture in verse 7 and 8 is perhaps these Levites in smaller groups helping the people to understand the law. Verse 8, they read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that people understood the reading. So there's a hunger for God's word. There's a listening to God's word. There's an understanding of God's word. God's word is central here in Nehemiah 8. The great tragedy, of course, is we live in a day which isn't remotely like that at all. There is such little appetite for the word of God in our day. And even in many churches. Churches where you think they would be the hungriest of people. Many churches God's word is sidelined. Marginalized. And other things take over. But it's impossible to miss the centrality of God's word here in Nehemiah 8. And this is something as a church that we seek to imitate. Uh, not only in our, in our architecture and the way our buildings are designed, but our whole approach to worship. We seek to have God's word central. But we need to be careful, don't we? Because there's a temptation. There's a temptation that Reformed Presbyterians can easily fall into. Uh, we may think we're strong on teaching. We might think we have a good priority when it comes to the word. But the temptation is to be satisfied with merely that. To be satisfied with a mere listening of God's word. And the challenge of Nehemiah 8 is actually what do we do after we've listened? How do we respond to the word? How does it change us? How does it shape us? Because that's what we see in this chapter. Change. Transformation. The end of verse 9. All the people wept as they heard the words of the law. God's word and the preaching of it led to conviction of sin. And that conviction of sin led to change of lifestyle. Verses 13 to 18. We didn't read them. But they describe one of the ways they changed uh, they realized, these people, that there was a feast from the law of Moses called the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. And they realized they had been neglecting this feast. 
uh, one of the mosaic feasts, it had fallen into disuse. Verse 17 describes that they immediately reinstate this feast. And that wasn't all. Their covenant renewal ceremony in chapter 10 is another consequence of, of change. They hear God's word and they, they respond. Having listened, they change something about their lives. They change something about the way they live. And I wonder, friends, and, and I, I've been searching my own heart this past week. When did you, when did you last make a change to something in your life simply because of something God's word said? When did you last resolve to avoid a path of sin or, or, or to pursue a path of obedience just because of something you read in God's word. Maybe in regards to the Lord's day. Or in regards to honoring your parents. Or in your financial giving to the Lord. Or in regards to family worship. Or prayer. I think some of us, we might be shamefully embarrassed to answer that question. It's one thing to sit under the preaching of God's word, had to be hungry, even eager for it. But it's another thing to respond to it and, and to obey, to be a doer as well as a hearer, James would say. And I hope and pray that over the last number of weeks, with this being our sixth study in covenant renewal, I hope and pray God's word has been leading and, and shaping us for today. That the scriptures have been something of a catalyst for you. Uh, laying a foundation when it comes to covenant renewal. Just as in Nehemiah's day. The foundation. The foundation for covenant renewal. We think secondly then. The preparation for covenant renewal. The preparation. Moving into chapter 9. Uh, the renewal itself doesn't take place until chapter 10. But this ninth chapter is a crucial element in the process. It's an element that we've seen time and time again in our covenant renewal studies. Uh, the prayerful confession of sin. Confession of sin. Here we are, chapter 9, just a few days after the events of chapter 8. Uh, we find the people in Nehemiah's day once again assembled together. Verse 1 describes them assembling with fasting and in sackcloth. Verse 2, they stood and confessed their sins. And just get a, get a grasp, really, of, of how long uh, the, the time span here. Verse 3. They stood and read from the book of the law for a quarter of the day. Some three hours. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshipped the Lord their God. For at least three hours, these people are standing, pouring out their hearts in confession of sin. And that follows with a prayer from the Levites. Uh, which is recorded verses 5 to 37. Really the whole of the chapter after the first four verses. Uh, this is the longest recorded prayer in the Bible. Nehemiah 9. We can't even begin to cover it properly this morning. But it gives us a tremendous pattern. A tremendous model for prayer. And maybe two things to pull out. Uh, the first in their preparation for covenant renewal. Uh, there's a refocusing on God in this prayer. A refocusing on God. It seems that through the, the ministry of God's word. God has become more real to these people. It seems that they've, they've discovered him afresh in a new way. How, how great he is. How glorious he is. How awesome he is. 
Uh, verse 5. Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise. This is, these are big thoughts. Big, big prayer. Verse 6. They see him as the creator God. Creating, sustaining all things. Verse 7. He's the electing, choosing God, choosing Abraham. Verse 8, he's the faithful, covenant God. Verses 9 to 15, he's the miracle-working God who delivered them out of Egypt by his strong and mighty hand. It's summed up in verse 32. The great, the mighty the awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. There's almost this fresh amazement at who God is, what he's done for them. And it's not so helpful for us this morning. Sometimes we get so caught up with our own troubles and our own concerns, our own problems, that we lose sight of, of the greatness of God. Sometimes that the setbacks of life just get all out of proportion. And covenant renewal reminds us we need to be people who who think great thoughts of God. Who think great thoughts of God. There's a refocusing on God here. But there's also in this prayer a recognizing of sin. That comes forth very clearly. A recognizing of sin. They've already spent hours in confession. But but this prayer describes it further. Uh, Verses 5 to 15 of the prayer. Really extol and praise the Lord beautifully. Verse 16 however begins with the word but. Verse 16. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their necks and did not obey your commandments. And then once we follow through the prayer, there's other patterns here. Verse 7, they, verse 17, they refused to obey. Verse 26, they were disobedient. And rebelled against you. Verse 28. They did evil again before you. Verse 29. They acted presumptuously. And did not obey your commandments. But sinned against your rules. There's a looking back here over about a thousand years of biblical history. And there's a looking back and a recognizing a toxic pattern of sinful rebellion. Time and time and time again. There's a recognition not only of past sin but but personal sin as well. Which is crucial. Verse 33 has the phrase we have acted wickedly. And verse 37 refers to our sins. This pattern over and over. Sinning, sinning, sinning. We read this. And we maybe think. And we ask ourselves. How could they sin like this? Did they never learn these people? And yet are we much better friends? Are we really in any position this morning. To criticize. How many times have we asked for forgiveness for the same sin over and over and over again? And we come again. Here I am again, Lord, at the throne of grace, making the same prayer of confession. How many duties have you and I neglected, friends? We look at our lives and really they are a similar catalog of failure and rebellion. In many ways our sin is is worse than theirs. For we live 
on this side of Calvary. And we can see clearly how those sins of ours nailed Jesus to the cross. And even since last week's remembering of his death in the breaking of bread, we have since then committed sin upon sin upon sin. And this chapter teaches us that in preparation for renewal, we need to intentionally and deliberately refocus on God and recognize our sin. And we've mentioned this in previous weeks. Covenant renewal is a time for examining hearts, for, for having our hearts exposed and laid bare. Confessing sin as a nation, as a church, as individuals. Of course, a wonderful thing in this chapter, that the great encouragement for us, uh, we find in the words of verse 17, uh, just tucked into verse 17, towards the end, we have a tremendous little phrase. Verse 17, our God is ready to forgive, ready to forgive, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. So let's not be slow in seeking forgiveness, friends. Charles Spurgeon has put it, he is more ready to forgive than we are to offend. He's more ready to forgive than we are to offend. So praise God for those words, ready to forgive. And, and if you're not a Christian this morning, what an invitation that is for you. What an invitation that is for you. Uh, living under the weight of your guilt and misery. Those words, he's a God ready to forgive. Ready to forgive. The preparation for covenant renewal. The foundation, the preparation. And then thirdly, the demonstration. The demonstration of covenant renewal into chapter 10 now. Uh, and really, we're coming to witness this renewal in Nehemiah's day. It actually begins at the end of chapter 9, verse 38. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. And there follows a list of people who sign this covenant commitment. Uh, you have some of the names recorded. Uh, first of all, Nehemiah himself, the governor. Uh, with him, a number of priests, then a group of Levites, uh, then the leaders, the rulers of the land. Uh, there's some 84 names listed. Uh, before finally, verses 28 and 29, we have the common people. And all the people, rest of the people, it's described. Uh, so none too important, none too unimportant. Wives, sons, daughters, all with knowledge and understanding. But those in spiritual oversight leading the way. And in like manner this morning, the elders of the congregation will lead the way. In our signing of covenant commitment. Leading the way under the authority of Jesus Christ. We'll then be asking you. Those in the congregation in, in full communicant membership of the Reformed Presbyterian Church of Ireland. To follow suit. And on a separate covenant document. We'll invite uh, parents to come with their children. Uh, children, young people who haven't yet professed faith. To record their names as being present today. Uh, maybe parents especially helping the younger children. Uh, so, so not being excluded from this renewal. Uh, but acting as observers. Uh, recorded as being present. No one compelled to sign. Uh, this isn't imposed on the people of God. Rather the invitation extended as one of the privileges of church membership. That in response to grace, it's a joining with the congregation here in making this fresh new 
commitment to Christ our King. This is about a willing heart response of people who are glad to devote themselves to Christ. And the commitments before us today aren't anything more than should be expected of any Christian, really. Certainly, they aren't anything more than the covenant promises many of you have already taken when you came into membership of the church. And in that sense, it's right to speak of a covenant recommitment, uh, promising afresh to submit to Christ as king in every area of life. And just as in Nehemiah's day, it's so practical, this, this, this enterprise this morning. Uh, their renewal, it touched down in so many areas of life. Uh, for instance, from verse 30, uh, we see they committed to avoid the sin of intermarriage. The sin of being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, they promised to keep and observe the Sabbath day. They promised to provide money, grain, animals for the offering of the temple. And just today, our covenant commitment, it, it's, it's extremely practical. It touches down today on so many areas of life. The sanctity of life, both at beginning and at end. God's design for marriage. The, the biblical pattern for sexuality and gender. The sin of pornography. Uh, the trampling of the Lord's day. I hope you see how, how profoundly relevant it is. But there is one little phrase from the renewal in Nehemiah's day. That I want to draw to your attention. Just, just as we bring things to a close at this stage this morning. A phrase that, that should linger in our hearts. It's at the very end of the 10th chapter. The very end of chapter 10, verse 39, the last few words, we will not neglect the house of our God. What a statement of faith that is. What an example of covenant commitment that is. We will not neglect the house of our God. Of course, in that day, it literally meant faithfully attending and, and physically supporting the worship services of the temple. Uh, the New Testament makes clear the house of God refers more to, to people as they gather, that more than, than any building as such. Nonetheless, this isn't any less a commitment than it was in Nehemiah's day. And so essentially... In our covenant commitment this morning, we're promising our allegiance to Jesus Christ and his church. Uh, you could say we're promising not to neglect the house of our God. It is possible to neglect the house of God in all sorts of ways. Some neglect the people of the house of God. Some neglect the worship of the house of God. Some neglect their gifts in the house of God. Some neglect their service in the house of God. Some neglect their children in the house of God. Some neglect membership in the house of God. Some neglect the place of prayer. In the house of God. Some neglect their giving. In the house of God. So really today. Is a good day. To make a fresh heart commitment. As elders. Deacons. Families. Individuals. We will not neglect. The house of our God. As we do so. We, we, we have an eye fixed upon Jesus Christ. In all of this. We remember wonderfully, he did not neglect the house of our God. Rather, he was found in it weekly, as was his custom. 
And ultimately at the cross, he gave himself for the house of God. It was said of him, wasn't it? Zeal for your house consumes me. So this morning, we look to him, our zealous, loving, committed covenant head, seeking to walk in his steps that we too might not neglect the house of our God. Amen. Thank <clears throat>